Uh, once again, uh, Mike, uh, me, and uh, our, our Mike, Robert, and I are, are at GSU. Lexi uh, Bandemer was a grad student working with the program at GSU, but is now at FSU in a program there. And Denise uh, is at the University System of Georgia uh, and I think leads faculty development. Uh, so we'll go ahead and jump in. Um, so we, we wanted to talk a minute about general education or core classes at GSU um, and, and how much of, you know, in the U.S. higher education works uh, at, at the core level, these, these general courses that students have to take. Uh, Mike, Mike Metzler put these uh, uh, slides, these first few slides together. Uh, he's, he's having a, a little bit of problem with the, uh, his throat, and so I'm going to do these, but Mike might come in at some points. So uh, Georgia State requires all students, like, like many universities in the U.S., uh, requires students uh, who are getting a bachelor's degree or an associate's degree to take a wide variety of general education courses. Uh, and our core curriculum uh, is supposed to provide students with a broad background. Uh, and, and, and in many ways, I think this comes out of the idea of a liberal arts education. Uh, uh, and, and I think it's not hard to understand where this could be valuable, but a lot of what we're going to talk about is how uh, sometimes the way that the core of the general education in, in US, the U.S. functions is often uh, uh, has lost a lot of its purpose. Uh, so, George, just a little background, we are an urban research institution in Atlanta. Uh, we are one of the most diverse uh, universities in the country, uh, and we have a high population of first-generation college students, a uh, high uh, population of people who are eligible for Pell Grants, which are uh, eligible for people who are in lower uh, economic brackets. So, um, Let's see. Let's go to the next slide. And, and typically, uh, you know, these courses, these core courses count for about a third of, of the uh, classes that students take in, their, in a four-year program. Uh, here's just a quick list of some of the areas that are covered in this. And so, you know, you, you can imagine if for most of this, just standard arts and sciences uh, education with, you know, a smattering of courses in each of these areas. Uh, and so Mike drew this out, kind of showing how often these courses feel very isolated to students. Uh, they have to take, you know, uh, they have to take courses in a whole bunch of different areas, but they seem typically very disconnected from one another. Uh, they have these requirements, but they're not really being told why they have to take these courses. They're not being asked to make connections. They're just taking these courses, and often these courses are the cash cows of uh, various departments. And so they, because English has two courses in the core or whatever, you know, they get tons of support for grad students to teach a whole bunch of classes. And often it becomes just a feeder for uh, your program or just a way to train grad students to teach, uh, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but if it's the only thing, then it would be problematic. And, and so we wanted to ask just really quickly, and I know uh, we've, we've only got a couple people here, but we wanted to ask, you know, if, if your institution, wherever you are, uh, has a core or general education component, and, and could you give us a sense of how many of those courses are designed for students to make connections in these courses? So do you have a general education uh, program uh, and then is there any attempt to connect those courses, or is it just here's this slate of courses that you have to take? So if anyone would like to throw something in there, that'd be great. Okay, so I see Julia saying that, I, I guess, University of New Mexico, is that right? Julia, could you tell us, like, what, uh, you know, what your general education is? Does it kind of resemble what I'm talking about here, or, or is it something quite different? Um. We actually have eight areas, so humanity, communication, social science, fine arts, uh, what else, second language. So whether the courses that the student take connect to the major or not depends on how the instructor 
frame the course and how the advisors advise to students. So every, um, every lack of a better word, every pathway to a major, you lay out how many hours a student has to take in one particular area. So some of them are really actually um, mandated by the state of New Mexico. I hope that gives you an answer. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds similar, and, and certainly mm -hmm. uh, there are choices within the majors. So we have what are called meta majors, and so if you're a social science meta major, you're encouraged to take the parts of the general education. And within your major, there is an area like, okay, here are courses you have to take within the core. And so there is some connection to the major, but a lot of it is general requirements at GSU and a lot of schools. And, and I know internationally, sometimes this is totally alien and this is not part of the way it works. Uh, I, I see a note from Alea. Uh, we did have a coordinated study program uh, for a 10 credit class where two instructors would collaborate on combining classes from two disciplines into one that had a common theme it satisfied two requirements. It was cut due to funding and schedule issues. Yeah. There's been some discussion to pair math and science classes. Yeah, so those sound like very exciting uh, kind of exercises in trying to do some of the more interdisciplinary and showing students how these ideas connect. Uh, and, and we're experimenting with very similar things. That, but like Alea is saying, you know, so often that's governed by funding and scheduling issues, and, and certainly we are bumping up against some of those. Uh, so I'll, I'll continue here. And so a lot of what EPIC is doing, and the EPIC program stands for Experiential Project-Based Interdisciplinary Curriculum. A lot of what we're trying to do is show students connections between these courses as students are taking them. And so the, the, the idea is initially we were trying to find courses that naturally fit, you know, and overlap with one another, like biology and psychology, American government and American history. These things that are required in the core, uh, or, or at least are a choice within the core that a lot of students take, and trying to just make natural connections. So we started that direction. We'll talk a little bit about uh, how we've moved a little bit away from that as we've gone. But the, the general point is to try uh, to show the connections between forces. Um, so a, a little bit of program history. Uh, our, our provost in 2018 uh, created what she called a moonshot committee. Uh, I think a lot of universities have been doing this for the past five years or so, trying to say, what is the university going to look like in 20 years? And how are we going to prepare students in this new environment of ever-changing technologies? and AI and that sort of thing. So we had this committee and the EPIC program came out of that. It was the one piece that kind of uh, took shape, was funded some internally. And, and then we got a Teagle Foundation planning grant and then a uh, implementation grant that would support the program for, initially it was supposed to be three years. Now they are uh, saying we can spread it out over four years because of the pandemic. And maybe because the pandemic is continuing, they'll, they'll move it to five years. Who knows? Um, so the two main goals of the EPIC program are to, one, improve the core experience. And that's how we began, uh, trying to show the interdisciplinary uh, way that uh, every faculty member knows that these courses connect and they they know that they're deeply connecting but so often students know don't know this and so how do we get teachers to start showing this in the classes but also adding experiential learning um and and then goal two uh is to try to create long-term project-based learning opportunities for students uh and and this might be traditional in some stem uh, or universities that focus on STEM or engineering. But, but at a school like Georgia State, there, there is very little opportunity for students to do much project-based work, particularly the idea of doing project-based work over a long period of time. So these are the two goals of the program. Um, let's see, the, the goal one, the improving the core experience, a lot of what we're relying on uh, is our student success programs. I, I don't know, are other people um here uh, I, I know i'm assuming in the u.s so uh julia in new mexico i Alea, i'm not sure if you're in the u.s or, or where you are um 
is is student success a huge buzzword? Is it something that they're you know the university is really focused on? So Alea, yes, you're in the U.S. Is student success something at, at your universities? And Chris too. Uh, I see several more people. Uh, just so we can get a sense of, like, do people know what I'm saying when I say student success? Yes, yeah, student success all the time. Julia says, <laughs> yeah. uh, yes. Okay, so yeah, it looks like everyone's very familiar with this. And so, some of what we're trying to do with Epic is tap into what we've been very successful in. Georgia State, if if we're known for anything, is our student success efforts and how they have been very successful, uh, particularly for students who often aren't statistically successful in college. And so, uh, so one of the things we're using is freshman learning communities. Almost every student uh, who enters GSU is a part of the freshman learning community where they take their five or six courses their first semester all together with 25 uh, student cohort. And so what we're trying to do is use that and where student success is interested in how those cohorts, you know, make it uh, student retention better, time to graduation better. What we're trying to do is improve the learning that happens in those. And so utilizing that, knowing that these 25 students, almost all of them are in these five classes, we can be very deliberate in scheduling those classes and making sure there's some communication between these courses. These are not co-taught courses. You might have 25 students in a 100 person class, so we can't count on everyone being everything, but we can know that our 25 students are in these five courses. So we can say, hey, let's put American history and American government together and let's have the te teachers talk about like, okay, I'm talking about the constitution at this point in the semester, so maybe you could talk about it at the same time. Or I'm talking about the civil rights movement, and we're both talking about this from different angles. And so, so we're trying to leverage those freshman learning communities to do some of this in just this work. We're doing a lot of uh, faculty development workshops. We've had around 80 faculty in, in our first, uh, uh, we're entering into, I guess, our third year, uh, and we've had about 80 faculty come through various uh, faculty development programs where we're getting faculty to think about this, often having really interesting conversations about, you know, so many faculty say like they had these moments uh, when they first entered into college where they understood that their forces were connecting and it kind of blew their mind and shaped the rest of their experience. And that's what we're trying to give the students, trying to say to faculty, you know this, you know that American government, if you're teaching that class, it's so connected to psychology, it's connected to statistics, it's connected to history, it's connected to journalism. And just make that more explicit in your class through syllabus statements, through readings, through assignments, uh, that sort of thing. And so we're working on, uh, you know, having these faculty development work and shots and increasingly getting faculty to create uh, course material that we can add to an online interdisciplinary library where faculty can grab that assignment and say, oh, that would work for my class. And, and it shows how, you know, the scientific method is similar in the in biology and psychology or, or whatever it might be. Uh, or this video talking about reparations and, and it's uh, sociology, African-American studies, business person, and, you know, whatever. Like trying to create material for faculty to use to show this in the courses. Uh, in these core courses in particular that are meant for kind of general students. Uh, the second part is project-based learning. Uh, we're, we've based our uh, program on Georgia Tech's Vertically Integrated Projects Program. It's been around for about 15 or 20 years at Georgia Tech and about 40 universities use this. But at Georgia State, what we're trying to do, and once again, based on this VIP model, is to allow students to work over multiple semesters. So, you know, two semesters, three semesters, two years, uh, earning course credit, working on a team with freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors, grad students from different disciplines on a faculty-led group, working on a real project, something that it has some public-facing element, and that students can earn small amounts of credit and continue doing that work. And so the idea is that uh, 
you know, so much of the real world, and, and I know that's problematic saying university versus real world, but so much of the career, the careers that students are going to go in or any work that they're going to do is not based on a, you know, 15 week semester or whatever it is. And, and to really develop skills, particularly skills like teamwork, uh, kind of project management and organizational skills, any big project, um, you need them more than a semester. And so it, it's trying to do this. And for faculty, it, it, the idea is like, you can really build a lab and a team, particularly if you have some students that are with you for several years uh, that can really get work done. We're having a lot of success with this. Uh, so uh, so that's the other big part of the program. Uh, I don't think we have time to go into these examples of the project class, but if there's questions later, we can do that. Um, but basically, the idea is that, uh, that for faculty, it allows them to build relationships with one another across disciplines. We are a giant university. We have 54,000 students, I think. And so our, our departments are often massive. And the idea is, OK, uh, let's talk to one another and see what other people are doing in your classroom. And that can be a really uh, important experience. That uh, we're trying to create shared resources. Uh, we are finding the productivity coming out of these project labs is quite good. Uh, we have a very few number of these so far, and we're trying to grow the program. But we also we already have several grants. A lot of these, several of these are funded. Uh, we've gotten like publications in the uh, Washington Post. Uh, we've had some. Uh, we've we've had some pretty good successes so far, and, and we're pretty new to it. Um, and then the idea of connecting teaching to research uh, is, is something that faculty often want, but has struggled to kind of figure out how to do it. For students, uh, the idea is for them to understand and to be reflective about why they're taking the course they're taking and make connections and then try to apply what they're learning to their majors, to real world issues that they face. Uh, or, or that they fear in the news, or that they might be working on as a job, or that they're just interested in, uh, increased career competencies. And uh, we're finding, and a lot of what we'll be reporting on, because this is a uh, total conference, is we are finding really good assessments, uh, uh, or opportunities, and, and finding that something we're doing is working. And so we'll, we'll move in that direction. Letty, you want to take over? Yeah. Um, okay, cool. I wasn't sure if my mic was on. <laughs> yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I'll be discussing um, some of our sources of data through EPIC. Um, over the past two years, we've collected a large amount of data from students who have participated in the program. Um, and you can see here listed um, is kind of an overview of some of those data sources um, from the past, as well as some of the sources that we plan on um, for the future. So um, as you can see, there's a variety of sources, like um, we have some surveys that students took at the beginning and end of the semester, we have class observations of teacher-student interactions, some focus groups, and we also have um, like some future plans for some walk-in tours. So here are um, just some of the data sources that we'll discuss more in depth today. Um, we collected information through online discussion board posts that students completed um, in their courses. And we also have some follow-up surveys of EPIC students a year out of the program, some plans for future research, and an examination of student GPA and retention data. Um, so course connections. Um, each fall, incoming EPIC students complete online discussion board assignments in their courses. Um, so three times during the semester, the students are prompted to talk about the connections that they see between the courses that they're taking. So the goal of collecting this data is to examine how students recognize links between their courses and essentially encourage those students to observe the connections throughout the remainder of their education. Um, so we would like to see if the students are able to recognize those clear um, kind of obvious course connections like topic overlap as well as any skills that they may um, that may overlap between their courses like time management or leadership or teamwork or things like that. Um, so these responses were coded for those 
obvious, clear course connections, skills gained, and kind of overall valence or overall feelings toward the EPIC program. So at three points in the semester, the students receive this prompt here that you can see, um, prompting them to discuss these connections. And on the right side of the slide, um, you can see listed here are some of the um, student responses. So one student mentioned learning about gender identity and how um, the topic connects to the world. And they say, on one end, I was learning the scientific perspective behind gender, while on the other end, I was learning about the world's perspective. So the student was able to make um, that connection, essentially. One student stated that they apply the lessons they learn in sociology to other courses, and another student mentioned that historical events in their American government um, class tied back to their science perspectives class. Um, so we also completed a follow-up survey. Um, this past spring, we asked students who participated in the first EPIC cohort to reflect on their time in the program. So the goal was to see how the program has um, essentially impacted students over, uh, over time. So listed here are some samples of student responses to the survey. In one of the project labs back in uh, 2019, students had partnered with the Children's Museum in Atlanta. So this student um, mentioned this past spring that they have continued working with the museum. So that's um, two years of collaboration with the museum that they've been able to um, do through this project lab. Um, one student spoke positively about the community aspect of the program and the ability to connect with other people. And another student said that they felt that Epic made it easier for them to adjust to college life. Um, so going forward, we plan to expand um, our data sources kind of beyond these self-reported measures by including more objective tasks as well. So listed here are some of those future plans to conduct research on the cognitive consequence consequences of EPIC. So these study plans include closed tests, uh, lexical decision tasks, and semantic priming tasks. Um, the closed tests will um, be used to measure conceptual knowledge gained by students after they have engaged with their um, interdisciplinary courses through EPIC. Um, and the lexical decision task will be used to examine EPIC students' efficiency of semantic access on um, words related to EPIC coursework. And then we also have plans to use a semantic priming task to measure the semantic connections between concepts covered in EPIC courses. So, so we have an assessment team and we meet every week uh, and it consists of several grad students, uh, uh, Mike, who is in our Center for Teaching and Learning with me, uh, who focuses on SOGL, uh, and then Robert Hendrick, who's in kind of a, the education, College of Education, but in a particular assessment uh, group there. Um, and we have been working with Omar Ari who uh, is doing some of the things on the last slide, particularly interested in interdisciplinary work and how that cognitively affects students. But uh, one of the biggest kind of assessment pieces that we've done on the uh, quantitative side um, is that we were given uh, information uh, about uh, a, a large group of students so we could start, you know, we could form a, a, a comparison group, a control group, so we could start seeing like how are EPIC students doing with X, Y, and Z uh, compared to this closely matched group. And so we, we initially had about 120 uh, EPIC students in our 2019 cohort, and that's grown uh, since then. But uh, we, after kind of matching for age, gender, race, and ethnicity, socioeconomic level, uh, their high school GPA, their first generation student status, all, all of these things. So a ton of information matched. I think we narrowed it down to 70 something in each group, highly, highly matched. Um, and, and so when we did that, uh, so yeah, each group had, had 71 students in it. 
uh, some of the information that we've seen after uh, two years. So this was our 2019 cohort. And it's important to point out, we only touched almost all of those students, the 71 students in the EPIC group, uh, that first semester. A few of them, a small percentage, continued on in some of these project labs, but really the main impact was that first semester. And so what we found is that um, the EPIC program students have uh, about, particularly once we pull honor students out of it, they have about a uh, half a grade point average higher than the control group. Uh, and so that was pretty exciting to see because of how well these groups were matched. Um, we've also found that it seems to reduce the DFW rate. So the rate that students aren't successful in the class, that they get a D or an F, they fail or they withdraw. Uh, that's something that we are doing for first generation students uh, is somehow, uh, you know, uh, improving their ability or their grit or how we're referring to it now. Uh, so we've also found recently, uh, this was the second piece of, of what Robert found in the data as he was uh, looking at it, that uh, we have a much higher retention rate of students. So after four semesters, um, 54 of our cohort is still at GSU, where over half of the ones in the non uh, cohort are not at GSU. It, it's really tricky in terms of COVID has had, you know, a major impact. And so I don't think we would see as much of a drop in either group if we weren't experienced, you know, if we weren't in this pandemic. But something is happening in, for these EPIC students that are making them stick around. Uh, and, and so we're, we're trying to parse that out with some of the work that Lexi has been talking about. And, and we've got a lot of projects that we're working on, assessment projects, to try to see really what are we accomplishing and how much of what we're doing is based in, you know, the interdisciplinary work, how much is based in the project-based work, or, or and how much of it is a combination of those things when you give students this kind of high impact uh, uh, first year experience. Um, so we're, we're at the early phases of a lot of this assessment, but we're, we're excited about the data and, and uh, some of the higher ups at the university are excited about the data too. So um, I'm going to hand it over to Denise. Thank you. Hey, y'all. Um, I'm Denise Demisi. I'm the director of faculty development for the University System of Georgia. And for those of you who don't know, the USG is made up of 26 public colleges and universities in Georgia, and Georgia State University is one of them. My office, the Office of Faculty Development, is one of support. So we um, run programs for faculty on these campuses, and we work pretty closely with the Centers for Teaching and Learning on these campuses. Um, so I'm kind of an insider and an outsider for this program, and that's what they asked me to do is to, um, as someone who is familiar with a lot of the programs at the um, different institutions in the USG, um, but as someone who is outside of Georgia State University itself, um, I was asked to comment on the design of the program, sort of put it into context of other programs in the USG, and to talk about scalability. So one of the things that um, the, they said in the presentation that was EPIC is designed to promote connections in parts of the core curriculum. And one of the things that they mentioned was um, they, they linked courses that naturally had connections. And, um, and I can totally see why they did that. But it also makes me wonder what would happen if they started to link courses that maybe didn't have such obvious connections. Um, and it made me think of an exercise I used to do. Before I came to this position, I was at the University of Georgia Center for Teaching and Learning. And one of my favorite activities to do with diverse groups of faculty or grad students was to give 
everyone two to index cards. So I have two index cards, and on one of them, on both of them, I would write my discipline. So for me, educational psychology. And then I would find someone to swap a card with, say someone in genetics. So ed psych and genetics, I don't really know what they have to do with each other. Um, but what I would do is I would define ed psych, and then I would define genetics, and then I would get together with that colleague, and we would talk about our definitions. So um, misconceptions that I have about what people who study genetics do. Um, but then we would also start talking about connections. And inevitably, we would find connections that we had no idea were there, just because I don't usually talk to people in genetics. Um, and so it was really exciting to find, you know, either sometimes it was a common research method or sometimes it was a common um, theoretical framework or, you know, you just never know. But the it was always really exciting for faculty and grad students to have those conversations with colleagues from across campus. And then to think about, you know, we're expert learners. This is what we do. But our students, they're new to this. And, you know, you hear students talk about the core. Why do I have to take this course? This has nothing to do with what I'm interested in. So helping them find these connections like they're doing with the EPIC program, I think, is a really, really good start at helping students see the bigger picture of the core and how these things connect. Next slide. So in looking at what Georgia State has done for their students, um, they've created these epic learning communities. Um, my understanding is that most of their students, I think what you all probably have around 5,000 freshmen coming in each year, I'm guessing. Um, and most, yeah, but not- a large number. It's a large number. It's a lot, right, yeah. Um, and a lot of them are in learning communities, and a small amount are in the epic learning communities. And I know it's because it's starting. Um, and then they are linked often with these project labs, but also the experiential learning. Um, and looking at your website, it talked about you know visits to museums or just walks out in the community that are you know grounded in what they're learning, and. Um, and then this focus on high impact practices. So this is a big initiative in the university system of Georgia. Georgia is a leap state, which means we are, um, you know, that we promote the use of high impact practices. And there are a bunch of institutions in the state that have different types of high impact practices, um, HIP programs. Next slide. But one of the things that we really focus on are not so much the 11 high impact practices as identified by AAC and you. And if you're not familiar with this at the end, I've got links to all the things I'm talking about. Um, but we really like to focus on the eight key elements. So, you know, I could say service learning is a high impact practice, but it could also be a low impact practice if you don't do it right. So really focusing on what makes something high impact, like the eight key elements, is um, it's a really important thing to do. So I thought, well, let me look at the eight key elements and see which ones are pretty obviously related to the EPIC program. And actually, they all were, but I forced myself to just pull out six here. So as I just read these, think about what Brennan and Lexi have talked about and how it really does relate to um, these elements. So periodic structured opportunities to reflect and integrate, check. Uh, opportunities to discover relevance of learning through real world applications. Public demonstration of competence. So again, these um, project labs that they're talking about. Interactions with faculty and peers. Significant investment of time and effort and performance expectations at appropriately high levels. So, I mean, it's really hitting these things hard and in a great way. And when we think about how these students are interacting, not just with folks in their learning community, with students in other learning communities, with grad students, with faculty, with community members, I mean, this is it's a really big thing. And to me, it's probably one of the 
big reasons that they had that retention rate and success is because the students who feel like they belong and they matter, they are more likely to persist. And we know that from the research. So thinking about how this has been supported, um, they talked about the faculty development workshops where faculty get a chance to get together and make those connections and then the digital library of resources so that you know those who come after will already have things that folks have put together and created so just adding to this library so then I always you know my big question is always well what is it that is making it so successful and as Brennan said it's probably a combination of all these things but you know the projects this opportunity to work on something that matters, that has relevance, that they're excited about. I mean, that, I just can't imagine having that sort of opportunity when I was a freshman. Um, and the cohorts, you know, having that opportunity to get to know people and work with people and problem solve. And then the connections, not only the personal social connections, but you know, starting to connect those disciplines and maybe seeing how the core is not just a bunch of classes that they make you take so they can get your tuition money, which is what we hear them say, but really something that adds to you as a whole person and can inform where you're going with your career, um, you know, the things that you're interested in studying. So then this always brings to challenges of scalability. And anyone who has ever done anything in any domain knows that, at least for me, I think resources and buy-in are the two, two major things. So we, um, you know, project-based learning, it's huge. It's, it's important, it is so powerful, but holy cow, it takes a lot of resources. Um, so. It made me think about some programs, some other programs in the USG uh, that are scaled up in terms of, uh, well, in a couple different ways. So for example, the University of Georgia has an experiential learning um, requirement where all students have to participate in one experiential learning thing before they graduate. And that office alone has a director, I think three coordinators, a grad student, an intern, so that, that's a crew. Um, GC Journeys at Georgia College, they have five high impact practices that every student will do before they finish, uh, before they graduate. Now, Georgia College has about 8,000 students. Um, UGA, I want to say about 30,000 undergrads. So you know, UGA big, Georgia College is smaller, but five high impact practices. Three are embedded in their courses and then two are outside of courses. Um, but again, a lot of coordination. They've got a pretty big team with some full-time and some part-time folks. Um, so thinking about scalability for here, for this, um, you know, there would need to be some pretty significant buy-in for resources, both human and financial. I know part of this, at least, is funded by a grant, which is great. Um, but you, you know, you need upper administrative support to really support this thing, and then also buy-in from faculty and students, because without an engaged faculty committed to this process, you know, it's it's hard to make something like this fly. Um, so, you know, to me, it's really exciting to think about what, what is going to come next with this program. I think their plan for assessment is great. It's really exciting. Um, I think figuring out what it is that makes it successful might help them know who to target in terms of recruitment, which students would benefit most from this. Um, but, you know, have, finding ways to offer it to more students, too, would be a great next step. Uh, next, last slide. So these are links. I think we've uploaded this slideshow, but these are links to all the things, I think, that I have mentioned so far. So I think we can, is it back to you, Brennan? Uh, sure, yeah, we can uh, spend the rest of the time uh, answering questions, giving more information for, uh, you know, if, if, if 
you want us to explore things further. There, we are doing a ton of stuff, both on the kind of faculty development side and curriculum side and the assessment side. So we can go into anything a lot more if people are interested or if they have things they want to share. Uh, so I'm going to turn back on my video, and I think uh, as long as we don't have bandwidth issues, maybe that'll be nice to see people's faces and we can ask questions. I certainly don't feel obliged to. Uh, uh, Brendan, if I should uh, make a comment to piggyback on uh, something that uh, Denise said, that uh, she calls it magic sauce. Uh, I call it explanatory power. Um, not only knowing that it works, but trying to find out why it works and what about it makes it work. Uh, and, and I think that my own particular interest in this project is to uh, develop some of that explanatory power. And I think the next steps in the assessment are set up to do that. Yeah, what, one example of that that we're trying to do. So Lexi mentioned that uh, how in this perspectives course, which in some ways anchors a lot of these, and the program is shifting and we're kind of figuring out new ways of doing things. Uh, but um, I, one of the questions that we've been asking all our ethics students just three times during the semester, how are your courses connected through the skills you're learning or the content you're learning? How is it connected? And we're really curious as to how much of what we're accomplishing is simply asking that question. Like, is it just asking that question a few times during their first semester enough for them to, because there are connections across all courses. And if you ask students, almost all of them will find some connection because they know they have to find some, you know, sometimes they're not the deepest connections. Sometimes they're quite interesting, but we don't know like how much of it is having the faculty that we're working with making connections to different disciplines or how much of it is is it just the student saying oh i should be thinking about this and so we we've come up with a survey trying to and we're hoping to have one cohort of epic students uh one cohort that in one of their classes or actually we're talking about like five cohorts, so the, these FLCs. So, uh, you know, having 100, 125 students that are in our group, they're asked this question and they're getting the kind of overlapping content. Uh, have one group that is asked that question, but they don't, we don't have any sort of intentional connection. And then have one other just total control group, they're not asked the question. And kind of try to see you know, through surveys, are they making connections between classes? And so the way we're setting it up, at least we're planning on it now, we're right in the middle of it. Uh, I need to respond to a couple of the grad students who've written the questions and, uh, uh, and they're waiting for me. But uh, like asking just really quick, like on a scale from one to five, you know, how are your classes connected? And then do your professors explicitly talk about connections to other disciplines and asking just some basic questions. And then they have to flip a page and go into, okay, now provide examples of that. We didn't want to ask them to provide examples initially because part of our hypothesis is as soon as you ask them to think of it, they'll start thinking about it and be like, yeah, my courses are connected. And so, I, you know, we'll just see what goes. So we're like just going all these directions, like, what effect does walking tours have? What effect, does, you know, we're, we're excited, or I'm super excited. I think our group is excited about it. Um, but yeah, so, sorry, I, I'll, I can talk all day. So, uh, any other, uh, Julia, I, I really like your response to the student success. It's saying like student success all the time. Uh, do you want to talk about that a minute? Because I, I, it sounds like there's some frustration there, which I can certainly understand in terms of, uh, you know, how universities have latched onto this. Well, thank you for asking. Um, I do not, okay, give you a background. University of New Mexico, we have a main campus. It's a research one university. And then we have four branch campuses that operate similarly like a community college 
and they also we also serve as like a recruiting arm for the main campus. So I am I work at the branch campus. My road there, I'm a sociologist by training. And my role there is really, I'm a chairperson of the social sciences division. So last year, our campus got a five-year Title III grant. And right now, we're working on guided pathway. So trying to get students enrolled in similar classes and whatnot. And that's your topic of your presentation really piqued my interest because I have been really rallying for experiential learning, uh, high impact, uh, not so much project-based because our STEM faculty member has been doing that. So some of the things you mentioned really hit hard back home. And I plan to go back and speak with our dean and other faculty members, see what we can model from your project and just kind of, like a better word, steal from your model. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and we, yeah, I mean, we would love to collaborate. Uh, we'd love to talk and learn from what y'all are doing. We, it sounds like we have almost identical campuses. We have a down, a giant downtown campus that about six or seven years ago was combined with a very large uh, series of perimeter schools that mm -hmm. were two year community colleges. And so it sounds like we ha are very, very yeah. similar. So it, yeah. it seems like probably, I'm guessing we have probably not the same demographics, but maybe similar uh, uh, kind of socioeconomic groups or I, I don't know, but I would love to talk yeah. about that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yes, so yes. I, I definitely, have... yeah, thank you for the invitation. I definitely will, will connect with you, Brandon. And I apologize uh, because of the connectivity uh, I just turn off my uh, video. I was told to. Participants, I turn off. <laughs> so uh, when when you mentioned about the retention for the first two years, that really got me excited because essentially that's our student base. Yeah, our campus is located 30 miles south of Albuquerque and is pretty much in a very rural uh, community. So many of the students that come to us, they face non-academic barriers in addition to them unprepared for college work. So we have a lot of challenges, but I call them opportunities. <laughs> well, and and yeah. Georgia State, yeah, is very, very similar. And I think Georgia State over the past 10 years has become kind of nationally recognized on these student success measures that have uh, helped drastically, you know, improve our retention rates, our time to graduation rates, but almost all of them have fallen under that student success umbrella that has mm -hmm. very little to do with what's happening in the classes and more to do with advisement and scheduling and which are great things. But what we're trying to do with Epic is say, okay, now let's try to leverage some of that to, to kind of do faculty development and talk about what's happening in the classes and hopefully even boost up further. Uh, as Denise was saying, like it particularly focused on uh, high impact practices, giving them this really big push with high impact practices their, their first uh, semester. So, well, and, and Alea, you, you mentioned wanting to know more, more about the walking tours. That's that's one of the things that's just been on my radar for some time uh, and and have had a lot of success with students with it, but we haven't done any assessment yet. Uh, so, so increasingly in my classes, I will take them on two to four walking tours uh, uh, during the semester. And the whole point of that is to get them thinking about how course material that we're learning and they're learning in other courses connects to the real world around them like we are in the middle of atlanta and so regardless if they're in a history class political science class african-american studies class a sociology class or whatever you know so many classes you're probably talking about the civil rights movement and hey georgia state's campus is right in the middle of downtown atlanta is right in the middle of you know and so we've had We've got some digital walking tours that, that faculty and grad students and undergrad students have built 
uh, on like the, the sit-ins movement in Atlanta. So students can walk around guided by their phone uh, to these big moments in the sit-in history, which are right on GSU's campus. Uh, we are right in the Sweet Auburn district, which was, uh, you know, where, you know, MLK was raised, where his father preached, where, you know, SCLC is, where all the, you know, and it's just ridiculous if we're not sending our students out into the world in our local environments where students are walking every day because that's what makes it stick. And it doesn't have to be, I mean, we're trying to develop these on our perimeter campuses as well that aren't in the middle of downtown to think about how their campuses connect to various things. And that can be the sciences. There, We digitized this tour that a geosciences professor had made about 40 years ago about the stonework in the high rises in Atlanta. So there's like 30 buildings that you can go to and see like, okay, this stone is an example of this and it came from Italy and it's this type of rock and da 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 uh, So it can go in all sorts of disciplines. And the idea is like, these are inherently interdisciplinary in some way because you're walking around in the world. Uh, but but also it's kinetic, it's, it's a different form of learning. It's, you know, so uh, I, I love it. The students always report that's their favorite thing um uh and but we need to know why like what does it do uh and, and and i don't know we haven't figured out exactly how to measure that but we're curious about trying to do something around it i love that so much brennan my my doctoral work was in uh informal learning and situated learning and and it, it's i just love it it's so fun it's so yeah fun. it's just fun yeah. And students remember things that are fun. It's a break in the routine. It, you know, they're going to remember those those walking tours so much better than sitting in a classroom. Even like a super interesting dynamic lecture, it's not going to have the the impact as walking out and like making those connections in the world. We uh, just uh, a, uh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say we have five minutes left, so. Um, if anyone doesn't have any more questions, um, I have one perhaps that you could answer. You spoke about the faculty development workshops. What would you say is the most, if you could only give one faculty development workshop, what would you include in that workshop? So the way we're doing it now, we, we've done like, a, we, we spread it out. So we, with the virtual, we moved to half day, but we wanted to do kind of full day before the fall, full day before the spring, uh, with a cohort of 20 to 30 faculty members. Um, I think the main thing they like and they get out of it uh, is we do a lot of speed dating uh, where we'll just say, okay, before they come into the workshop, it's, hey, hey think about what your, you know, uh, learning outcomes are for your core courses that you teach within your discipline and think about some of the common content that anyone teaching this class, you know, it's going to vary, uh, you know, what is taught in the American history class, but everyone talks about the Constitution, everyone talks about civil rights, you know, <laughs> what are the common things? And uh, to come in prepared with that, and then we just say, okay, let's randomly throw you in a group with three other faculty members and y'all talk for 15 minutes about what connections you see and then just flip it again and send them to another group of you know four faculty members and have that conversation again and then flip it again and have that like they like they really like that they they love talking to one another and they don't get any chances to talk to one another uh, <laughs> yeah. so like so like the students it's all about making connections for the yeah, faculty yeah in order to deliver that to the students. We've got one um, question about how do you, from Julia, how do you recruit students into the EPIC program in the last minute or so, if you'd like to address that? You know, in, 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 in many ways, we have not. Uh, with the project labs, we really need, at the upper level students, we need to start figuring out that recruitment because the project labs are going to rely on that of having some upper level students that can be kind of leaders in the lab, particularly if they're with us more than one semester. But the general FLC part, the freshman part, and right now most of the project labs are, are freshmen, um, we've done pretty much zero uh, recruitment. We're always so 
scrambling to put the FLCs together because it's it's difficult, right? Anyone who's done this, you know, knows like, okay, to figure out like, okay, here are these five faculty members and we want them teaching these courses together. And, you know, it's really difficult. So every semester, something comes up where everything falls apart. We have to restructure it. And it's like the last five orientations out of 30 orientations or when they can sign up for ours. And so in the case, <laughs> our students are the most struggling students because they're the later orientation people. Um, and so almost none of them know they're even getting into it, which is kind of what I want. I don't want it to be like, here's the honor students. So we did have an honors cohort and it was delightful, right? But I don't want it to be just random students kind of stumbling into this thing. That's what I want. Excellent. Um, any other questions from anybody before we close? That was such an insightful uh, presentation. Thank you so much. So many interesting things, and I'm really excited about about this. And I'll definitely be doing a little bit of talking to see if we can. It seems like a humongous project, but perhaps we can just start in small, bite-sized chunks, um, moving towards this. So thank you so much. Um, also, just wanted to let everybody know you can connect with the panelists or with other people in the session via the chat function on Canopy. So if you go into either the attendees or the speakers, there's the option to um, connect with uh, everybody um, that's at the conference in that way. So if you want to share your information and also you could listen to the recording afterwards again if you want to um, remind yourself of people's names and where they're from and so on. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the conference. I hope to see you in one of the upcoming sessions.